the Lord is good. As we wait on him and look to him, he begins to speak to our heart. And I'm learning again in prayer the importance of getting my mind quiet. And we've been speaking about that, about quieting our hearts and our minds to hear the voice of the Lord. A lot of times we can go to God and we, we know the importance and the power of prayer. If there's anything that the disciples ask the Lord, they asked him, Lord, teach us how to pray. And of course, he gave them a, a somewhat of a format, but it was really just the entrance in of worship and then asking the Father to have his will in earth as it is in heaven. But then we're looking for his daily bread, our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. And we know that we're not living by natural bread. We've come to the place where we're seeking the word of God. Jesus, when he was tempted of the enemy, he said, I don't live Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And that is our bread. And once we're able to hear God's word and we're able to have that communion with him where our will and our desire is crucified and we begin to find unity and union with the son of God who said, I do nothing except what I see my father do. Then we begin to find that there's more than just bread for us, but there's meat. And meat is to do the will of the Father who has sent us into this earth. We came first as natural people born of our natural parents, natural heritage of the fallen race of Adam. All of us have sinned and come short of the, of the glory of God according to that nature. But those of us that have been born again, and we must be, there's such an importance that we recognize and that we begin to teach people as Jesus spoke to Nicodemus, you must be born again of the Spirit. Otherwise, there's no entrance in to the understanding and the knowledge of the kingdom of God. And we're preaching, just as has been preached for 2,000 years, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But not only is the kingdom of heaven at hand, but the kingdom of God truly is within you. And it's within us, and it's been planted in our heart as a seed. As just a word of faith, we've been born again, we've been begotten again of the word of faith. We receive the good news of the gospel. Thank God, when we receive the good news of the gospel, we became a new creation and all old things have passed away. And we're born again of an incorruptible seed. Our sins have been totally blotted out by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we've been seated together with him in heavenly places that we might know the plan and the purposes of God and the revelation of Jesus Christ, who even this day is building a house. He's building a temple, a temple not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. We forget the benefit of really sinking our teeth into the word of God and beginning to really grasp after the understanding of the spiritual reality, the life that we now have, that everything out here that we experience according to our senses isn't the real life, but the real life is that which is being revealed through Jesus Christ, through the revelation of Jesus Christ, who is indeed within us, and he's within you. You received him by faith. He's the director. He's the captain. As we spoke this morning, he's the commander in chief. He's giving you your marching orders according to the will of the Father. And now he has a plan and a purpose for your life that far exceeds all the expectations that we ever had as children. Because it's greater and more exceedingly abundant than all we could ask or even think according to the power that works in us. Praise God. Praise God. And we've received that power. We've received that understanding. But it's, it's growing. There's a progression and I, this is where I was a lot last year in the study of the kingdom of God. How many times Jesus would teach and he would say the kingdom of God is as such and such. And he would say the kingdom of God is as a mustard seed, though it's being as the smallest seed. He said it grows up and becomes a great tree. And, and his whole purpose is for his people to be fruitful in the earth, to be fruitful and to express the nature of the life of the Father, which is love, joy, peace, 
those things that pertain to the kingdom of God, which isn't meat and drink. It isn't those things that we can take in and get for our natural man so much as it's the things that we can give out of the kingdom of God that's been placed within us, the riches of the kingdom of God, which is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And we're not just to live in that, but we're to be bearers of that life, to give it out completely and continually by the Spirit of the Lord. But I want to go real quick to Ezra. I'm going to try to get through some of these scriptures that I felt like the Lord laid on my heart. Ezra, of course, is during the time after the Babylonian captivity, and, and there were so many prophets that had warned, that is all a type and a shadow of that true life that we've received in Christ Jesus today. The new covenant, everything that was of the old was just a foreshadowing. It was just a precursor. It was just a pre-telling of the reality that we would receive in Christ. And all those prophets spoke of that, which we would receive in this day. And they reached out, they stretched out to try to understand the glory that would be revealed in the children of God today. But they spoke of those things, seen years and sometimes centuries into the future of the glory that would be revealed in Jesus Christ. And here we have... In Ezra, he's speaking about, a lot of people know and have read this story, but it was after the Babylonian captivity, when the children of Israel had been carried into captivity, and had been prophesied by the prophets, Jeremiah and uh, Ezekiel, and, and these men had stood and came to, the, to, to Israel and to Judah and warned them that they needed to turn away from the idolatry and turn back unto their first love, turn unto God. Turn away from the idolatry of the nations that surrounded them. Turn unto God. Otherwise, they would be carried away into captivity. And, of course, it was for correction. It was for that God is a wonderful Father. We see that again and again in the Scriptures. He doesn't do anything except that which will benefit His children. What He does is not for our suffering or for, suffering or for our destruction or for our beating us down, making us feel worthless, making us feel inadequate. It always is to break us down, only to build us back up in His image. His Word is like a hammer that breaks the rock. And yes, there's times when he, we, we fall on the rock and we're, we're crushed to powder, but He remakes us. He's the master potter. He remakes us and refashions us in the image of Christ. We have in that seed all that pertains to life and godliness. And that's how the Lord is building us up. Praise God. And he's made us co-workers together with him to build the house of the Lord. And that's what was going on here. In Ezra, they were Cyrus. It talks about it in the first verse of the first chapter. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom, and also put in it writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth the Lord God of heaven has given me, and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah, who is among you of all his people. May his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel, he is God, which is in Jerusalem, and whoever is left in any place where he dwells, let the men of his place help him with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, beside the free will offerings for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. Well, praise be unto God. That is a type and shadow of that which, in many respects, there's a, the, the Lord is always speaking in mysteries. That the whole people's lives have been used as parables. And Paul the Apostle began to understand it when Jesus came and knocked him down to the ground by that bright, bright light when Paul was converted and began to see that all that that Paul had lived by, all of that law, all of the prophets, all of the sacrifices, all of the washings, everything that he had given his entire existence to, was nothing more than a pattern of that which was to be fulfilled in his relationship with Jesus Christ. And through that relationship with Jesus Christ, he would have relationship with the people of God through the body of Christ, which is the temple of the living God. So all that pertain to the temple pertain no longer to a physical building. That's why it's so important that we always understand 
that when we speak of the church, we are never speaking about a geographical location or a building or a temple or anything that's made with hands. But we're talking about the people of God who have been called out of the world, the ecclesia, that have been called out of the darkness of the world into the marvelous light of the Lord, not for themselves just to be separated forever unto themselves, but they might learn of God and become the living Christ in the earth to go and be a part of the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ that brings the kingdom of heaven to earth and delivers all the remaining captives of the whole earth. Praise be unto God. That's the kingdom of God. That's the orders of the Lord. But of course, a part of that is building up that which has been broken down. That the enemy has come in and we're surrounded by groups and people and that in this day, if we've ever seen a day when the enemy has come in and, and made a destruction out of the house of God, has broken people down, uh, how does he do it? Always the same, through fear, through lies, through hypocrisy, through division, through all the things that we see, not only happening in the world, but in, in many respects, it's happening in the groups of those that love the Lord. We see the, 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 the destruction of the house of God. So he's raising up a people in this day to go and to begin to take part. And God is still the builder of the house. Jesus Christ is the builder of this house. If God doesn't build the house, the scripture says, they that labor, they labor in vain. Because we're talking about building up the house of God and building up the wall that's been destroyed. And that's what happened. And you can see it. Now, let, go real quick to me, just to confirm, and most everybody knows this word, 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, Paul talking about this spiritual house, 1 Corinthians 3, 9, amen. amen. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, you are God's building, and according to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another builds on it. And he said right there, you are God's building. You are God's building. But we thank God for the opportunity we have, and I might say we thank God for the opportunity we have to share these things, not just here with the people that we have here, and we're going to continue to reach out here in the local community as God leads. We thank God that we already have dear friends in San Diego. Not only that, here in California, all over the United States of America, but we also have now a growing family. And of course, our family goes far beyond those that we know as far as the, the body of Christ, the church, the called out people, those that are progressing through their relationship with the Lord. We have people all over this earth and in the unseen realm. <laughs> From Abraham to Isaac to Jacob, God said he's the God of the living, not the not the God of the dead. That means all those brothers and sisters from the beginning of creation that have walked with the Lord. We, we, we are one with them, though we're not able to have bodily fellowship with them. We don't even, aren't even able to really converse with them at this point. But when we're caught up to the throne room of God, we sense the presence of just men now made perfect. We sing that song. Even though it's not in person, we look forward to the days when we're able to gather together bodily. But not that we might know one another after the flesh because we've desired not to know any man after the flesh, but we desire to know Christ in them and Him crucified. And that which is pertaining to the resurrection from the dead, the power of an endless life that now even works in the children of God, not in the children of disobedience so much that are now ruled by the power of the prince of the air that rules, the Scripture says, in, in the children of disobedience. But our fellowship is with those who are giving themselves unto the Lord, that are falling more and more in love with Jesus because they see how much that He loves them and they feel the love of the body of Christ. And that's what it's all about. Building up one another. But back here to 1 Corinthians, the third chapter. Paul says it right there in the ninth verse. You are God's building. Speaking to the people of God. You are His habitation. You are the temple of the living God. According to the grace of God which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one of you take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, 
Wood, hay, and straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. I, I declare to you this day, and we know it by experience, we've been going through such a great time of trial, having our faith tried, having our patience tried, right? Having our long suffering tried, having our forgiveness, forgiving those that, that we feel have done us wrong, the, the situations that we experience. Some people, no doubt, have at times become angry with God. Why, God, why? Why would you allow this to happen? People have lost family members, people have lost loved ones, people have lost their health. This has been going on now in a great way all across the world. We've been in a major trial. The fire has been burning in our midst. And those who have built their house or the house of the Lord, and they're talking about in your own life because this is both a corporate or a body fellowship and it's also an individual walk that we each have with the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, it's going to be tried how you build with fire and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. What are you building upon that foundation? It will be tried with fire. And fire, we remember, it's not just the, the it's not just fire is actually the presence of God. God is a consuming fire. He comes in many different ways. Now a lot of people can't receive that because they believe that love only pertains to the love that we see and that we speak of in the world. Phileo love. But we're speaking of agape love, the love of God. We're talking about the love that has so many different facets. It's as the love of a father. A father loves his sons and his children so much that he'll correct them. And yes, he heaps blessings upon them and gifts and, you know, all of the intimacy that's needed to. And, and we're talking about that intimate relationship, that intimate walk. Thank God. But a part of it, of course, is a strengthening that comes through trial that comes through some hardship. Praise be unto God. Jesus, he, he learned obedience by the things that he suffered. And, and, and we take up our cross and we follow him. I'm not going to get off course here. But we thank God. It's all for goodness sake. It's all for the building up of the body. Nothing is to break us down or to bring destruction. It's all to be, bring greater strength. Praise the Lord. So he says, if anyone's work, 14, which he has built on endures, he will receive a reward. Well, where, where do we see that? Again and again in the scripture, when you go up into Revelation, it talks about to he who overcomes, will I give? Will I grant to sit with me in my father's throne? He'll become a pillar in the house of God. He'll have written on him a new name. He'll be given rulership and authority. All of these are rewards. It has nothing to do with the rewards that we think of when we think of the, the life that we have here in the flesh. He's not going to give us cars and houses and all these things. That, 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 that very much is a part of the temporal order here. What do we need a car for in the coming age when we can transport from one part of the world to the next as a spirit? You see, the, 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 the apostles had a foretaste of that. What do we need a house for? What do we need a mansion for up in heaven when God himself is our dwelling place? He dwells in us and we dwell in him. Our minds can't yet conceive of that. Not only that, but we won't, we won't be so concerned about prettying up and taking care of this natural body that's still a part of the fallen creation that continues to disintegrate. But we're receiving a new body, an incorruptible body, that'll never pass away. Praise be unto God. That changes things a lot. You, you see, so we're, we're, we're reaching out towards something much greater than what we have understanding of right now. And the Lord's giving us understanding so that we can begin to work for those things that are to remain. If anyone's work, okay, I, I got that. 15. So if anyone's work endures, he'll receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, He'll suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, 
yet so as through fire. Thanks be unto God. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is holy. Which temple you are? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Great encouragement. And he uses us to build up. Not only are we, you know, in, we're, we're, we're a dwelling place of the Lord and we have this intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus in our heart and in our minds. And each one of us at any time can begin to have that personal walk. We can go and begin to walk with the Lord in our heart and our mind. We can humble ourselves before the Lord individually unto him. And yet we, we have to always remember that which the Lord does in us individually is for a greater expression that's expressed when we begin to show to the world our oneness that we have with the body. God fitly forming us, taking us and fitting us in right where we are needed in the body, in the temple of the Lord. So go to 1 Peter 2, verse 4. 1 Peter 2, verse 4. Speaking about these stones that God has called to be a part of the building. You know, the Lord's so wonderful. Jesus, He was not only the builder of the house, which it speaks of, but He was the house. Not only that, but He was the chief cornerstone of the house. Praise God. Hallelujah. And the Spirit of Jesus is the anointing of the house. That which covers, the, the Spirit that covers the house. Not only that, but He's the one that fills the house. <laughs> and we could go on and on with all of what Jesus is pertaining to the house of God, and yet He's made, made us a part of the house. Coming to Him, verse 4, as to a living stone, the Lord Jesus Christ, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. Now see, that's a wonderful thing, because Jesus, He's the... Stone of stumbling, the rock of offense that many stumble over because of his word, because the carnal understanding can't receive the things of God, they're foolishness unto him. So those that are walking after the carnal understanding war against Jesus, war against the purposes of God, even though he loves them and he would do everything to save them, they have to come to the knowledge of him individually. They have to receive him and want him and desire him. And the Lord's love, who can resist the love of God? Praise the Lord. He will win them all with His love. Eventually. Praise be unto God. First, those that are called in this day, the first fruits. Then it's going to continue on because the first fruits become a part of the next harvest. Which is why Jesus said, pray therefore, as we said this morning, that the harvest is plentiful. There's plenty out here that need the salvation of the Lord and the redemption of Christ. And to be cut off from the cares of this world and from the deceitfulness of the riches out here and to be brought in to the kingdom. But he says, but the laborers are few. So pray therefore to the Lord of harvest that he might send forth laborers into his harvest. And the laborers go forth with joy. Praise God. Oh, there's times of weeping. There's times of sorrow because we mourn when we, when we come against that which is of the flesh that isn't ready to receive. But we continue in joy because he who sows in tears will reap in joy. Praise God. Hallelujah. So this is, this is what we're a part of. And that's why he says, even this precious chief cornerstone that's become the cornerstone of the whole temple, the whole body, he's the one that we're fitly joined and built upon. You also, verse 5, as lively stones were built up a holy house, a holy a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect precious, and who believes unto him will by, by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief 
cornerstone. And even as he is a priest over his own house, even now is he calling out a people to become a part of the priesthood of God. And we have to remember that Jesus stands as the mediator between God and man. He stands before the throne of God. He is our advocate. If we fall, if we, if we take a wrong step, if we sin or fall short of the glory of God, we have an advocate with the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, who intercedes on our behalf day and night. He doesn't sleep. He doesn't slumber. He continually is making intercession on the half of the children, but he's not looking to do it alone. He's got a people that he's called out of the world to become not only partakers of the building of the house, but partakers of the priesthood of house that they might offer up unto God spiritual sacrifices, even praise and prayer. Hallelujah. For their brothers and their sisters, both in the body and out of the body, those in the body to strengthen them, to do good, especially unto the household of faith but also under the disobedient because God loves the just and the unjust. And he gave himself not for a righteous man, but also for an unrighteous man. Praise God. Hallelujah. So he makes us co-workers together in this building. And that all of that in Ezra, and I'm going to go back there. But we, we, th these things that we're, we're speaking of, I'm not going to read all this, over in 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, Paul talks again about all these types and shadows. I'm not going to read it. I got it marked down. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 2. 1 Corinthians 10, 4 through 15. Talking about all these spiritual types that they experienced when they were coming out of bondage, out of Egypt. And they went into the desert and they drank water out of a rock. And the scripture says there in 1 Corinthians 10, Paul said that rock that they drank out of was Christ. Hallelujah. And they had a fire by night and a cloud by day, and they were baptized into the Jordan. Hallelujah. They were, they were baptized in, in, into the Red Sea. We also have been baptized. This was a picture of Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All these things, verse 11 is the one I want. Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the end of the ages have come. Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. Therefore, my brethren, my beloved, flee idolatry. I speak as to wise men, judge for yourselves what I say. Remember, this is the whole reason why the captivity came in Babylon. Because the people of God, which was God's Israel of that day, the Jews, they, they were disobedient. They didn't keep their heart pure unto God. And they, they were a type of that which we know we'll never be able to overcome through the fallen Adamic man who was given the law. The law is for the lawless and for the disobedient. And so the moment that we go to the law and begin to justify ourselves or try to measure up to the righteousness of God, the righteousness of Christ according to the law, we find out that we fail. And that's why they were ordained to fail. Because that was only a type to show us that the law is only a teacher or a schoolmaster or something to lead us unto Christ, to prove to us our unrighteousness according to the flesh that we'll never overcome by our strength, by our effort, by the works of the law. But when we come unto Christ and yield ourselves completely unto Him and begin to know His love, he empowers us. His life comes into us and we become more than conquerors, overcomers through Him that loves us and He begins to fulfill the law through us. Not by an outer commandment, but by an inner governing spirit. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus begins to become our direction. It's the spirit of God who's our teacher. And he leads us in every way that we could go, that we should go. He becomes the light for our path. He becomes the hearing for our ears. He becomes the feeling for our senses. We begin to live by him, not by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And it's the spirit that speaks Praise the Lord. That's why again and again, it's said in the scripture, let him that has an ear hear what the Spirit says unto the church. God wants us to have spiritual ears, but it requires us to present ourselves as a living sacrifice unto God, which is our reasonable service. Praise God. Hallelujah. 
I'm going to go to that. I think that's the, I got another, I want to go to 2 Kings real quick. I'm not going to go through all these. 2 Kings 25, this is the end where they were going into captivity. And what I really wanted from here, if you read through this, 2 Kings 25, verse 1 through, uh, I think it's down through 11. I'm not going to read it, but it talks about, about the carrying away to Babylon, all the people of God, and that the city wall was broken down. It talks about in the fourth verse, and that the king came in, and they, they, they took the king, their king, and in the fifth month, the seventh year, they came in to Jerusalem, and in verse 9, look at it, he burned the house of the Lord and the king's house, burned up the house. Guys, look at what Paul said. He said, every house that's built, it's going to be tried with fire. The foundation is right and true and just. But I'm telling you right now, that house had become corrupted. They had begun to build with other things other than the precious gold of the Lord. The, the oneness, the complete sanctification unto God. And guys, there's no, there's no real condemnation for them because it was ordained for them to be the pattern to show us that we would never fulfill these things by the law or by our own efforts right. or by outer commandments or by the governments and systems of men that always turn to idolatry that always turns the people towards leaning on other things towards gaining strength and health and protection and everything that people think that they need from the things of this world God wants to be those things to his people he wants to be the provision for us of everything. Our protection, our strength, our victory, our health, praise God. Our ability to overcome disease. He's our healer. He's our resurrection. He's our life. He's our keeper. Hallelujah. He's our correction. Everything that we have need of is found in Christ Jesus the Lord so that we don't have to go to the outer world to, to measure up to Him. All those things become idolatry. Amen? So the house of God was burnt, and it talks about it. You read there, the walls of Jerusalem were torn down. That's what Ezra and Nehemiah had to face when they came out of captivity. God called them to go back and rebuild Jerusalem, rebuild the house of God, and rebuild the wall. Hallelujah. This is very much going on in this day. And it's, it's a glorious thing to be chosen of the Lord, to be a part of the building of God. Both the material and the workers and the laborers together with Him. Amazing. That, the, that, that He doesn't use other materials, but He uses men and women to be His material. You're the gold and silver that have tr been tried of God. That's why over in Revelation it says, you, have, you, you, you think that you have need of nothing. You think that you're poor or you're rich and, 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 and you're really poor. All those scriptures. And he says, I would that you'd buy gold tried in the fire. He's talking about a relationship. And it's the Lord first and foremost, but the Lord resides in His people. Go to, back to Ezra real quick, the third chapter. A lot of scripture here, but this is good to me. And I pray that it's good to you, that the Lord will strengthen you and encourage you. I'm not going to be the only one in, in, to minister here, Lord willing. We want to share this with others and, and share. Uh, we're, we're not looking to any one man show in this day. We want to just flow together with the people of God. So we thank God for what He does give us, but we look to get more by sharing with one another, by allowing others to take part in the things that God is doing and to prefer one another. The Lord really taught me that as a young person, to always prefer my brother, to not to think too highly of ourselves, but to look to others, to elevate others above ourselves, which is so uncommon to flesh in the world of flesh it's always putting it's pushing down everybody around you to try to get up ahead climb the ladder the it's all reversed in the economy of god jesus became a servant and and he that was rich 
Paul said, became poor, that we through his poverty might be made rich. He took on all the sin of the world. And when all that sin came upon him, he said, Father, why have you forsaken me? All that sin that separates us from God came upon the Son for a moment so that all the righteousness of Christ, Jesus, might come upon us, that we, we might walk with, in peace with God our Father, that we might have communion with Him, unbroken fellowship, but not only with Him, with one another, that the ways of Babylon in confusion and misunderstanding and an inability to talk to one another because of the misunderstanding of flesh would be done away with, that it would be swept away by the presence and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ who comes as a fire and consumes everything that's not of God. And only the gold, only the pure life of Christ remains and all the misunderstandings and all the fear and everything that pertains to the flesh is done away with. Praise be unto God. And all we're left with is the pure and holy presence of the Lamb in our midst. And we find out He's the light of the city, and we're one in Him, and we become the spiritual Jerusalem that appears, that comes down from heaven, descending as a bride for her husband. Hallelujah, made white, made pure. And when we're talking about white, we're talking about the righteousness of God, just as Jesus, when He... When he appeared on the Mount Transfiguration, there was, a, there was a brightness. It was a cleanliness that appeared. It was that inner nature of Christ that was revealed. And he's forming us. He's fashioning us after that same image and likeness. Praise be unto God. Ezra 3, verse 1. And when the seventh month had come and the children of Israel were in the cities, the people gathered together as one man. Praise God. There it is to Jerusalem. One man to the capital city of God, to the, go the place of government. Here they would go and gather in Washington, D.C., where the president is and all the, you know, all the judiciary and the, all, all of the people that represent the states and the government. But here in the spirit, it's Jerusalem, not a physical location. No longer natural Jerusalem over there in the Middle East, but now it's the spiritual Jerusalem, which is the body of Christ, which is the people of the Lord. It's the sons of God that are being birthed in purity out of the womb of the church. Praise God. What a mystery. Hallelujah. This is the seventh month. This is the Feast of Trumpets in the, in the Feast of Tabernacles. Ezra and Nehemiah both their first real encounter together is in the time of the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Trumpets. You'll find it there. The seventh month had come, and the children of Israel were in the cities. The people gathered together as one man to Jerusalem. Then Yeshua, the son of Josadak, uh, and his brethren the priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and his brethren arose and built the altar of God, of Israel to offer burnt offerings on it. And as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God, through fear, had come upon them because of the people of those countries. They set the altar on its bases and they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord for the morning and evening burnt offerings. They also kept the Feast of Tabernacles, as it is written, and offered the daily burnt offerings and the numbers required by ordinances for each day. Afterwards, they offered the regular burnt offerings and those for new moons and for all the appointed feasts of the Lord that were consecrated and those of everyone who willingly offered a free will offering to the Lord. From the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord, although the foundation of the temple of the Lord had not been laid. Okay, to cut it short in righteousness, the, the, they, were, they were offering up literal animal sacrifices. And all the people, that was their, that's what they were called unto, according to the law. But we're not walking after the law of Moses. But we're walking after the inner law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. So we don't have to go find a lamb or a bullock or a pigeon or a turtle dove or all the animal sacrifices that they offered. But instead, Romans 12, I'm not going to turn there, chapter, chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Present your bodies a living sacrifice unto God. Hallelujah. This is your reasonable. Actually, you know what? Let me go there real quick. Let me go over to Romans 12. 
I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And then look here. Do not be conformed to this world, but be renewed, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Guys, that's what we're looking for out here, to prove what the will of God is. Prove it. It's been proved. It's been proven. It was proven in Jesus Christ. He proved the will of God. I came not to do my will, but the will of God who sent me. And I came to lay down my life for the world. And he became the savior of the world because he was obedient unto death, even the death of a cross. And he gave his life, not just for a few, but for all. Praise God. And all will come to the knowledge of this great glory of the Lord. But they're going to come to it, not just through people teaching Jesus, they're going to come to it through a people who are walking in Christ, who are laying down their lives for one another, who are taking up their cross and following the Lord, who are becoming the priesthood of God, who intercede on behalf of the people, not complaining that the government's wrong, not complaining that the neighbors are wrong, interceding on their behalf, lifting them up to God, knowing that what they're doing, they're not doing out of just a vicious mind. They might be, but they're really doing it because the God of this world has blinded their eyes so that they can't see the glorious liberty of the children of of God that comes through a relationship with Jesus Christ. God has ordained it for this purpose that you might be partakers of the divine nature of the Lord Jesus Christ, laying down your life for your friend, yes, even for your enemy, because Jesus called them all friends. He, he, his enemies to him were eventually going to become friends. Paul the apostle was an enemy of the cross of Christ. But Jesus made him a friend. When he appeared to him, the great love that was shown unto Paul, that nothing he had done in the past was held against him, even though he was crucifying, he was basically killing Christ himself because he was killing the body of Christ. Jesus made a friend so much out of Paul that Paul fell in love with Jesus. And he claimed to be a bondservant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And that's why he says here, when, you, when you're to be transformed by the renewing of your mind, prove that which is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Look at verse 3. For I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. So we being many are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Well, there's just a whole lot there. Uh, I, I just tapped 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter, 26 verse. It says, How is it then, brethren, whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edification. And that's what this is all about. It's about an edification, a building up of the body. That's the rebuilding of the wall. Those who have fallen down in, you know, condemnation. In some are lifted up in pride. You know, that's the, that's the coming of the Lord. To exalt the low places and to bring down the high places. Some are out of the way. The crooked ways are to be made straight. Those who have gone a crooked way that have come off the path of righteousness, Jesus leaves the ninety and nine and goes after the one that's out of the way. He doesn't condemn them and say, how could you go another way? He just goes after them and brings them back into the fold. And true enough, it may take some correction. It may take some fire to get their attention. But the Lord's so good and so faithful, He'll bring the fire if necessary to get their attention to turn them back into the flock so that their joy might be made full serving Him. Hallelujah. And not serving the world or serving their own will. Okay, I'm going to finish up here. Nehemiah chapter 8. Nehemiah chapter 8 comes right after Ezra. Ezra came in to build the temple. How necessary it is that we build up one another, the temple of God. But also, there's a wall of protection. The, the, the temple is built up so that we have a place of worship. We have a place of intercession. The wall is built up so that we have a place, of, we have something of protection against the enemy. Now, for those that have counted it, that there is no enemy out here anymore. 
which I can't understand why anybody would say that, because when we see people, the suicide rate has gone through the roof. Who's doing that? Not God. I'd say that's an enemy that's come in. When there's all manner of lies and hypocrisy that are going on all around us and people believing lies and being led away by lies, we know when there's doctrines of devils surrounding us, when, when, when a man doesn't know if he's a man or a woman or a woman or a man and all these things are all around us, all this confusion and all this perversion is all around us. We don't look at the person and blame them. There's an enemy that's come. Jesus said when, when, when the good seed was sown in the field at nighttime, in darkness, in a hidden time, the enemy came in and sowed tares among the wheat. Hallelujah. And what did he say? He wanted to go out and tear out the tares. The servant did. And the Lord said, no, let them both grow up. And in the day of harvest, because we need the day of harvest, because until the day of harvest, until the grain is fully ripened, you can't tell the difference between the tares and the wheat. They both look almost identical. But when the, the, the fruit has begun to manifest in the wheat, ah, now you know the tares because they're fruitless. They have nothing. It's all just a big show. It's all a bunch of facade. There's nothing behind it of any real substance or life. It's just a shell. Praise be unto God. And the Lord has anointed us for that purpose. And then to build the wall. To, to protect the people of God. And I, I think I mentioned that scripture over in, I believe it's Zephaniah. It might be Zechariah. get the Z's mixed up. But it says the Lord actually is a wall of fire around His people. So we know... It's the Lord that's the wall. But again, it's the people of God. We become a wall around our brother and our sister to protect them, to keep them. Hallelujah. We deflect the voice of the enemy away from them. That's, that's the good shepherd, the shepherd that protect the sheep. They, they drive the wolves away. They come in with false words and with things that are going to harm the sheep. We're not of those that are wolves in sheep's clothing. We're of the shepherd of our soul who comes in and he gives his life for the sheep. Praise God. He becomes a wall around them to protect them. Hallelujah. And he makes us shepherds of the flock. Pastors is the word. Hallelujah. Now, verse 8, or chapter 8, Nehemiah 8, 1. Now all the people gathered together as one man. There it is again. As one man in the open square. How important it is that we walk in unity in this day. We'll never find unity in the flesh. We're never going to find it in the ways that the world finds it or tries to find it. They can't find it there either, but they sure try. But here we have the unity that comes from the Spirit, comes from that which is hidden from the outer man, but only God can see. And He sees the Word of God is a sharp two-edged sword cutting asunder the soul from the Spirit and the marrow from the bone and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So it's the Word of God that appraises us. And not man's word, it's God's word. Hallelujah. And by God's word, we're able to discern where our brother and sister are at. And then we come to them where they are. Like Paul said, to, to the Jews I became as a Jew. To the Gentiles as a Gentile. To the Greeks as a Greek. He became all things to all men that by God's grace he might win some. The Lord's got me on fire that we need to win some people unto the Lord. To the love of God. It's all about the love of God. So they gathered together in, in the open square that was in front of the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men and women, all who could hear with understanding. Here it is again. On the first day of the seventh month. That's the, that's the day of trumpets. Praise God. There's spiritual implication there. It's not talking about a literal trumpet blow today, though in that day they took their shofars and they took the silver trumpets and they blew and they had a certain distinct sound that was blown to gather the people together, to assemble people. People think about it when they think of the army for mess hall, <laughs> calling people unto dinner time or whatever it is. It was a distinct sound. They knew what it was. This is the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. We become a part of that sounding of the Lord that gathers the people together as one man, hallelujah, that causes them to lay down their weapons of warfare and to take up 
the plowshares of the Lord, to beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Praise God. That's, that's talking about doing the work of the harvest. Hallelujah. Cutting people off from the things of this world to bring them into the kingdom of God. And, and all those that were able to hear, he read to them the book of the law. Look at verse 6. I'm going to end here. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. Then all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. And Nehemiah, verse 9, who was the governor, Ezra the priest and the scribe and the Levites who taught the people, said to the, all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn nor weep. Okay? This isn't the day of, of the fasting that we, that we see over there in Isaiah 58, where we hang down our head and we mourn over the brokenness of the world. This isn't that day, okay? It doesn't mean that we can't fast for our body's sake, and it doesn't mean that there's not times when we don't have sorrow. We weep with those who weep. But overall, we have a, a kingdom that we've entered into, and it's a kingdom of righteousness and peace and joy. Hallelujah! We're to spread the kingdom of God, righteousness, peace, and joy is to cover the entire earth as the water covers the sea. And he, look what he says. He says, Do not mourn nor weep, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. There's a conviction that comes. It comes to all of us. No longer again, 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 and again, and again. Not after the law of men, but after the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. He's the, co He's the one that convicts us. He's the only one that can bring change to us. We can see the wrongs of the world, but I'm telling you right now, you can go around and point out everybody's sin you want to, and you're not going to change their heart nor their mind. But the Holy Spirit, when He comes, He'll convict. Hallelujah. And he does it in a way that's going to bring them unto joy. There may be weeping for a night, and endures for a night, but joy comes in the morning, and he's the morning. Hallelujah. He's the day star that arises in our heart. He causes us to put on joy and to put on bowels of mercy. Praise God. So he said, don't weep. Don't weep. He said to him in verse 10, go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared. In other words, for those that don't have this word of the Lord, because they are talking about natural bread and natural substance, but we're not living by natural bread. Now we can, we can feed the hungry and we can, we can do what Jesus did. We can feed the multitudes and there's times when we need to do that, but we're not in a day of drought of natural bread. We're in a day of the, of a drought of the word of God. Hallelujah. So when the Lord speaks to us His Word, and we're going to know when it lines up not only with the book, but with the love of God, the love that comes when we're walking with Him. It, it brings a true conversion. It'll bring people unto the Lord, into the kingdom. So He says, This is the day. This day is holy to the Lord. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And all the people went their way to eat and drink, to send portions and rejoice greatly because they understood the words that were declared to them. The Lord, the joy of the Lord is our strength. We're, we're so glad that this is good news, that we, we're, we're ministering the gospel of peace, the gospel of good news to every corner of the earth. We're doing it as the Lord leads, so we're not just going on our own. But as the Lord leads, we're going to continue in this, in the things of God.